from NJ.com. This is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome on in, Giants fans, to episode 124 of the Talk is Cheap podcast. I'm Matt Lombardo alongside Ryan Dunleavy. And Ryan, the NFL draft is officially in the rearview mirror. Before we get too far into this podcast, what's your one big picture takeaway of what Dave Gettleman and the Giants were able to do or not do over the weekend? Uh, my big picture takeaway would be that they took a quarterback, but not the quarterback in the first round, which was the thing I said would stun me uh, if they did it. And th- 48 hours later, I'm still stunned. Yep. And my big picture takeaway is they came away with the best overall prospect in the draft. And I think they helped themselves in the immediate future. Who knows about the long term future at quarterback? But before we get too far into this thing, just a couple of housekeeping items for you. If you're listening to us on YouTube, we really appreciate it. Please toss us a like on YouTube. But we'd love if you subscribe on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. He's at our why Dunleavy? I'm at Matt Lombardo NFL. And Ryan, let's dive right into it here. You talked about the fact that they didn't take a quarterback in the first round and they took one later in the round, which is what you said going into the draft would be the biggest surprise. Um, how does that impact the Giants quarterback situation, do you think, this year and moving forward? To me, look, uh, you have a 37 year old quarterback and Eli Manning. The best, one of the best, there's two great things you could say about Eli Manning's career. One, he wins the big, he wins big playoff games, especially on the road. And two, he's incredibly durable. And even Pat Shermer in the off season, before he even got to work out with Eli, just kept talking about how that 210 game streak doesn't happen. Durability, the best ability, what's that cliche, Matt? The best ability is Is availability, availability, right? So But what happens if Eli Manning gets hurt, right? Peyton Manning missed a whole season with the Colts after he had a streak similar to Eli's. Um, Andrew Luck, we've seen what happened to the Indianapolis Colts when he injured himself. He didn't have a streak like these guys. Brett Favre had a streak like these guys, and eventually he got hurt. So some event – and listen, knock on wood, right, if you're a Giants fan. I'm not talking to me. But what happens if Eli does get hurt? The Giants clearly think they're a playoff team, right? They That's why they've done all these things that they've done. That's why they traded for Ogletree and kept Beckham and made all these – win now moves. So what happens if Eli Manning gets hurt in like the second game of the season? Now you have a team that wants to go to the playoffs, all these veteran snacks, Jenkins, they ain't here to finish three and 13. So now you're going to have a team and then your backup quarterbacks have zero snaps between them. I haven't looked it up, but considering Eli is one of the most durable quarterbacks ever, you're going to talk about Eli Manning with whatever, you know, like, thousands and thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of snaps in his career and his two backups have zero career snaps combined that seems like you're putting you're really handcuffing yourself uh experience wise i don't love that and i don't love the idea that you and i don't know if every fan understands this matt so let's let's talk about a little bit how football practice works and if you if you know how this works then you know skip ahead 30 seconds so a football (laughs) practice you know, 80% maybe of the reps uh, go to the first team quarterback in season. It's probably even higher. A hundred. Uh, yeah. And then second team quarterback goes with the second team uh, offense. And then maybe the second team quarterback will get a handful of snaps with the first team offense. Very rare. Yep. So all training camp, the portion of reps that are now d- given to the number two quarterback and then the number three quarterback obviously gets less reps. That portion, Typically with scout team during the regular season, by the way. So whoever's the number three is probably running scout team during the regular season. But let's – even in, during training camp or even during mini camp, like there's less reps for the number two guy than the number one guy and less reps for the number three guy than the number two guy. But if you don't know who your number two and your number three quarterback are, if you're taking – what let's put Eli aside, which is the chunk of the pie. Let's say the rest of the pie of the fifth of the twenty percent that are non Eli reps. You're now taking that twenty percent and splitting that in half and giving half of that twenty to each backup quarterback. That doesn't make any sense to me. To me, you're splitting the difference. You're not fully invested in somebody. You're now gonna you're doing both guys the disservice instead of getting Davis Webb 
or Kyle Laletta the developmental time. You're now getting both of them that time. And unless there's more hours in the day uh, that I that suddenly I don't know about, they're now each getting 50 percent of what they would get as 100 percent of developmental time if the Giants brought in a Derek Anderson or a Kellen Clemens or some veteran who was never really going to be in the mix, was just there as an emergency yeah, arm. I, I, I agree with a lot of that, Ryan. I also disagree with some of it because I think that if you had brought in a veteran journeyman backup quarterback, they're still getting some practice reps, right? And I think that when you're talking about developing a quarterback, it goes far beyond beyond just the practice field. These guys are going to be in meetings. They're going to be in film study. They're going to be having one-on-one time with Eli Manning in the room with the quarterback's coach, Mike Shula, and offensive coordinator, Mike Shula, and Pat Shermer, of course. So they're going to be in the building this year. And I think that my biggest takeaway from taking Kyle Lalletta, uh, the Giants obviously had him graded fairly high, and they love the value of getting him in the fourth round. Two quick things here. One, I think that taking Saquon Barkley at number two underscores the fact that Dave Gettleman is not sold on Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, or Josh Josh Allen developing into a franchise quarterback. We can debate that till we're blue in the face. We can debate that uh, whether it was the right thing or wrong thing to do. The bottom line is Saquon Barkley is here. Darnold is across town and Rosen went to Arizona. But the other thing is we won't know what those guys are going to be for 10 years. So that's one element to this. The other element is I think that Pat Shermer has a profile. I I think we'll know what those guys are going to be in about two years. So, Uh, and we and we we very well might we might be looking back on this as a big mistake, or we might look at it as you know the Giants got their guy, the Jets got theirs. Um, But the other thing is, I think Pat Shermer has a profile of the type of quarterback that he wants to go to battle with and he wants to develop. Look, Davis Webb, six foot five, big arm, lots of moxie, lots of confidence, seems like a bright kid. Kyle Loretta. 6'3", not necessarily a big-armed kid, but he has accuracy. And Ryan, you and I were both there during the minicamp last week, and he basically said he likes tall quarterbacks who can see over the line of scrimmage, and, and being a bigger-bodied quarterback helps. Eli Manning, six foot five, has that going for him, but doesn't have the mo- mobility of a Webb or a Loletta. So I think the Giants are absolutely trying to win now with Eli Manning, but if they don't get to the postseason with Barkley and Beckham and Ingram and Shepard, um, there's no more excuses. And I think that next year is the year where they turn the reins over to either Webb or Loletta. But wouldn't you, you want to know which traded. guy, Matt? Wouldn't you want to know? That's the that's my point. Like, So let's say that happens. Let's say they don't, man. They turn the reins over. Wouldn't you want to know in January which guy you're turning it over to? Rather I think than- they'll know by then because they'll have had them both in the building for a year. They'll both been on the practice field. Maybe they both will have played in mop-up duty. And that's where Ben McAdoo in the previous regime did this coaching staff and this front office a disservice by not getting Webb on the field last year. If Webb was on the field last year, I don't know that they take Kyle Loletta, but the yes. fact that they did homework on Loletta and that this is a, a quarterback that this regime identified, I, I think that that's where if he doesn't have a leg up, it creates a competition for that mantle next season. Yeah, it's uh I guess we'll see. I just to me, to me, I'd rather spend this whole year getting one guy ready and uh, having Ryan Roeder or Mike Shula or Pat Shermer or I just keep using the name Kellen Clemens as an example. Kellen Clemens dedicated to getting Davis Webb better than I do having even if, you know, quarter, the one thing Shermer said that I thought was interesting is he compared it to college and how in college, you know, you're the star freshman recruit four-star kid one year and you're the future and then the next year you quickly realize that they're going to bring in another four-star future of the quarterback future quarterback that's why the college football quarterback transfer rate is so high because teams just keep recruiting over their last quarterback and these kids don't want to stick around and be bench quarterbacks when they can transfer to a one double a fcs school like kyle laletta and become a draft pick so i don't know to me i'd i'd devote everything i'd pick a guy and devote everything to him rather than uh rather than try to split yep. split the and, baby. And, so. and here's the other thing. If if one works out and the other doesn't, we've seen how desperate the NFL matter. is when it comes to quarterbacks. You can flip them. You can trade them. And I think that we saw, um, you know, f- pedestrian quarterbacks like A.J. McCarron fetch a big money contract yeah. in free agency. Some team will give up an asset for one of these two guys. But Except, except A.J. McCarron's played in games. 
yep. Eli Manning never sits out games. So that a reason unless, is, unless let's say that they're four and four and eight going into the yeah. final stretch, I don't know that they're going to put Eli out there. So well, I think he might regime, he might kick and scream if they try to bench him again. So yeah, and and we'll see how this regime reacts to that. I don't think that they would be uh, as concerned with Eli's legacy as they are about building. But we can get into that as the season rolls along. But let's get into the pick by pick here and give out our grades, Ryan. And obviously, the number two pick in the draft, Penn State running back Saquon Barkley, a guy who did it all at Penn State. We talked about him leading up to the the draft. How much love there was in that building for Saquon, what he does catching the ball, what he does as a runner, what he means to the culture. Uh, uh, Steve Tilsch over the weekend said he believes he can be a role model for his generation. I graded the pick an A based on his impact for this team. The fact that if you're not going to take a quarterback, you take the best player in the draft. That's what they did here. I gave the, the pick an A. What was your grade for the Barkley pick? I would give it a B plus. Uh, I didn't actually do grades for the paper, so I'm kind of making these up on the fly. I give it a B plus, and that has nothing to do with Barkley. I think Barkley is a tremendous player. I think that, you know, he'll probably go to a Pro Bowl this year. He'll probably go to a bunch of Pro Bowls in his career. Uh, but I've just seen too many backs in my time watching the NFL. Barry Sanders, LaDainian Tomlinson, Adrian Peterson, who are Hall of Fame backs who have never played in a Super Bowl. Uh, to me, if you, the only reason it's not an A is because I, th- I would have picked Sam. If it was me, I probably would have picked Sam Darnold or Josh Rosen. Yep, and I think that there's an argument to be made there. Uh, let's move on to the second round pick, Will Hernandez, uh, the guard out of UTEP. And some people had him as the number two or number three offensive lineman in this class behind guys like Quentin Nelson, like Mike McGlinchey. You and I talked about the fact that we weren't sure that Will Hernandez would even be on the board at number 34. And obviously, after adding Barkley, you round out your position group with Beckham and Shepard and Ingram. And now you can fortify your offense of line a little bit with a guard who's plug and play ready. If it's if I'm Pat Shermer, uh, I'm putting Will Hernandez alongside Nate Solder and I'm solidifying the left side of my line and I'm running Barkley over that side of it. I give this pick an A plus. It's an A plus for value. It's an A plus for the caliber of player. And let's not forget that when you watch Will Hernandez's tape at UTEP and you watch Saquon Barkley's tape at Penn State, Hernandez is the best offensive lineman that Barkley's run behind. And I don't know that it's any anywhere close i'd give it an a a plus is that's a big time grade matt uh i uh i'll give it a i'll give it an a all the reasons you said i thought he'd be gone somewhere in the early 20s of the draft uh in my mock draft my last mock draft i actually had the giants trading up from 34 to 30 to get hernandez in case he slipped he ended up slipping the giants didn't trade up uh, they let it roll the dice and, you know, came up aces because he uh, he slipped all the way to 34. I think that's the guy. I think if the Giants were picking in the 22 range, that's the guy they would have picked. So to get him at 34 is kind of a home run. Yep, I think it's great value. And you look at your biggest needs going into this draft, at least on offense, it was offensive line and running back. You check those boxes with your first two picks and you got the best running back in the class and a top three, top four offensive lineman. So I gave Gettleman high marks for that pick. Round three, they come back uh, at number 66 and they take Lorenzo Carter, a guy that I really liked coming out of Georgia. He's an aggressive, violent downhill player. He can set the edge as well. Uh, His production wasn't always there. Uh, I think that part of that has to do with the fact that he played in a defense with Roquan Smith in the middle and he was just a playmaker all over the field laterally behind the line of scrimmage and all of those things. I think Carter kind of got lost in there. I give this pick somewhere between an A and an A-. minus. I'd give it probably a B. Uh, I like the pick. I like the way he fits the 3-4. I like here. One of the things I really like about this kid is, and again, you and I are both kind of college football gurus. So we, we know this better than, than most people, five star recruits in the sec do not play special teams as a senior. And Lorenzo Carter was playing special teams as a senior for Georgia, as a senior starter for Georgia, blocked a field goal in the college football playoff semifinals, uh, Clearly, a kid who does not who does not have uh, 
you know, uh, sense that he's better than that or whatever. He's clearly a kid who's going to come in, work hard, take what he can get. He'll be on special teams from go with the Giants. Uh, I like him in that. I like him as a situational pass rusher because the Giants absolutely abused Olivier Vernon and Jason Pierre-Paul last year. So the Giants have an additional pass rusher they can throw in the fold. I'm a little worried about his production, but for now I'll buy into the Shermer Gettleman narrative that he was doing a lot of things, unseen production, creating pressures for his teammates, setting the edge on runs. I'll buy that narrative for now. Yeah, I'd relate his college tape to a lot of what we've seen prior to this year from Brandon Graham, a guy who got a lot of pressures, didn't get a lot of sacks early on in his career, got to the quarterback, forced him into other sacks by other players. We'll see if Carter can have that kind of impact. But I think he plays a rather significant portion of snaps immediately, Ryan. But this underscores once again the Giants' commitment not only to James Betcher's defense, but also the linebacker position, where up until this year where they traded for Ogletree and brought in Morrow, not a lot was invested in that spot in years past. Yeah, I agreed. Yep. Um, and then BJ Hill, the number 69 pick, three picks later. This is a little bit of an interesting one because you have arguably one of the top two nose tackles in the NFL and Snacks Harrison. Harrison was a no show during the mini camps. Read into that what you will or what you won't. But he I was, look at. Uh, he was there yesterday, though, uh, according to his social media account, at least. He had posted a video in the locker room. So uh, that's. Well, there something. you go. Uh, br- breaking news here on the Talk is Cheap <laughs> podcast. But BJ Hill out of NC State, um, guy who played interior defensive line there, played alongside Bradley Chubb. I like this pick. I I think that it's a depth pick. I I don't know necessarily, Ryan, that stacking – and again, teams win Super Bowls by fortifying both lines on offense and defense, and certainly on the defensive line, rotating fastballs, rotating guys that can get after the quarterback so you stay fresh up and down the depth chart. But I don't know that the Giants were in a position to draft for depth at this spot. I gave this pick a B. How about you? Uh, all things considered, I'd say I'd probably give it a B plus. Uh, I actually like this pick. Uh, I think if you were at the mini camp, like we were, you saw that they didn't defensive tackle was a really thin spot. If they're moving Dalvin Tomlinson to end on the three, four, Robert Thomas was kind of playing first and second team defensive tackle was down snacks there. Uh, I like this pick. I think they needed to address defensive tackle, uh, Especially Snacks is dominant when he's on the field, but you want, again, like Vernon, like JPP last year, he's not on the team, obviously, anymore. Actually, this is the pick that Giants used, uh, they got for JPP. They got BJ Hill, essentially, for JPP. Uh, I uh, I like the idea that you could put BJ Hill in and give Snacks a little bit of a breather. Snacks doesn't play on a lot of third down passing yeah. situations, and the Giants think this guy might have a little pass rush in him. Yep, and I think that from that standpoint, it's a very good pick. And like I said, you can't go wrong stacking bodies at defensive tackle or along the offensive line. Kyle Loretta, we got your big picture (laughs) thoughts on this pick. Um, I read your column on Saturday. I saw your reaction in the press room when the pick was made. Ryan, what was your grade on the Loretta selection in the fourth round? Listen, again, I can't – I can't – this has nothing to do with Kyle Loretta, right? This could have been – Insert quarterback here. This could have been Kyle Bolin, the Rutgers quarterback, or Trace <laughs> McSorley, the Penn State quarterback, or whatever. This has nothing to do with uh, tr- with Kyle Laletta, but it makes no sense to me. I just, for all the reasons we laid out at the bottom of this podcast, at the top of this podcast, for all the reasons I laid out in my column, this pick makes no sense to me. There was just too many other places to go to get a number three receiver or to get a backup safety or to get a middle line a inside linebacker or to get um to get help at cornerback uh there were just too many other places to go with the fourth round pick to me this picks a d Wow, I give it a C plus. I give it a little bit above that D. I, I understand all those reasons, but I think that if you're you're going to draft a quote unquote developmental quarterback, um, you can't go wrong with a guy with that height, with that accuracy. We'll see what Mike Shula and Pat Shermer can mold him into. Maybe he's Eli Manning's successor, or maybe he's uh, you know Trey Bate in a year or two down the line. Which you can say the same fate about Davis Webb. But I think that we can both agree that. It, they the reason that Loretta was drafted was because that they didn't see Josh Rosen or Sam Darnold or Josh Allen as potential franchise quarterbacks. Do we agree on that? Yes, we agree on that. Yes. 
Moving on to round five, um, one of the more perplexing picks for me, R.J. McIntosh, defensive tackle out of Miami. Same argument that I have there that went for the B.J. Hill pick, adding a rotational defensive tackle. You take some pressure off snacks. Um, but you look at the production, five and a half sacks, 23 tackles in, in 29 career games. Um, McIntosh seems like he was a rotational player in college. And maybe I didn't watch enough Miami to notice him more than that. But it feels like you're taking a rotational player, making him into a rotational player. And round five, these are now when you start to throw darts at the chalkboard or the dartboard, rather, trying to find players. And maybe McIntosh surprises me. I give the pick somewhere between a B and a B minus. But I think that they are really loaded up on defensive linemen by taking two guys in in rounds three and round five. Yeah, I, again, this is kind of like the Laletta thing to me. Like, I don't really understand. I didn't think this was a huge need. I thought if you had, if you were the Giants, you could go Snacks Harrison one, BJ Hill two, Robert Thomas three as your defensive tackle group, and then you know add an undrafted free agent or whatever. I would have gone with a position of need like wide receiver, cornerback, safety, inside linebacker. I, I thought it was interesting. The very next pick was Maurice Hurst who also plays defensive tackle. Yeah. Uh, he's a guy some uh, mock experts had in the first or second round. He slipped all the way to pick 140. The Giants picked Mashinto- McIntosh over Hurst. I thought that was interesting. Um, they'd pick and you out- and I have both watched Maurice Hurst a lot, and I think that sure. maybe the medical might have been an issue there. Ex- but ex- Except except RJ McIntosh, I didn't even know this till yesterday, had a medical thing come up too. He has a thyroid condition that caused him to lose like 30 pounds at the NFL yeah discovered at the NFL combine. So if that, so why not take more research? If you're taking a guy with a medical issue, I don't know. That I think is, first was the more pedigreed player between the two. Yeah. And then, then the pick after that was Shaquem Griffin, who the whole football world should know. He's the guy with one hand from central Florida, the American athletic conference, defensive player of the year, tremendous story. Uh, he's a guy who, you know, if the giants, like I keep saying inside linebacker, he's a guy who I think could have fit the giants as an inside linebacker. So, uh, I think there were guy, Micah Kaiser went a couple of picks later. He's an inside linebacker. I had t- targeted to the giants with their fifth pick quite a, in a couple of my mock drafts, uh, seven round giants, mock drafts, uh, Marcus Allen, a safety out of Penn state when the fifth round, I just thought there were other places to go than back to defensive tackle for the second time in three picks. Yep, I agree. Now, Ryan, let's let's uh, round back to the the number two overall pick and Saquon Barkley, and uh, not necessarily Barkley in terms of his scouting report or what his impact is going to be on the Giants or how he fits or any of those things. But I thought it was really interesting. Um, Dave Gettleman, in, in a lot of ways, rightfully, in some cases, I think a little bit over the top, was criticized over the weekend for his comments following making the selection of Barkley at the press conference, saying that. Uh, he he said that he wasn't even going to take the phone call for trade offers that, you know, don't waste any time. We're taking Saquon um, in some regards. I get it, especially because you're taking a running back and because of the value or the lack of value in that position in the NFL. Um, I, I get it because you might be doing your franchise a bit of a disservice by not even entertaining trade offers. Um, but but I think some of it was over the top because if Dave Gettleman viewed Saquon Barkley as the type of player that's going to help the Giants win now and that they can build the franchise around moving forward and he's quote unquote their guy um similarly to quarterbacks if if you see your guy on the board i don't see the harm in taking your guy but what do you make of the criticism of gettleman over the weekend for not trading back or not trying to trade back from number two well i was on the trade back beat i mean i i thought that if they didn't like the quarterbacks, which obviously they did not, then I would have traded back. I would have the Den- there were rumors, you know, on the internet before the draft started that Denver was trying to get up to two to five from five. I yep. to me that's the perfect situation for the Giants. Trade back to five, you end up with Bradley Chubb and a couple extra picks. Um to me that's to me that was the perfect thing to do. Um but I don't think he, I, I think criticism, I mean, look. I'm not saying he had to make the trade because 
he got Saquon Barkley, who we all think is going to be a fantastic player. So he didn't have to make the trade. I don't understand the idea of getting it in the pick in in 28 seconds like it's an uh, like it's a sprint. Like it's a race. <laughs> yeah. What if somebody offered you and there's no indication that anybody did this. But what if somebody offered you a Ricky Williams trade where they're basically giving you their entire draft for Saquon Barkley? That's not worth at least taking the phone call. I mean, to me. Uh, to me, yeah, take the phone call. There's no reason not to use at least five of your 10 minutes. I understand Gettleman's point. It comes down like the quicker you do it, that shows how everybody, how much you believe in this player. Like, look at the conviction we have. There were a couple times in the past where I think like the Vikings or the Ravens or both like ran out of time with their pick. Well, that's that that illustrates like, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. So. Um, well, yeah, along, along those lines, and you brought up the Ricky Williams trade where Mike Dicker traded his entire draft and two picks from the following draft to move up and get Ricky Williams um, in 1999. Uh, Jeff Howe from The Athletic had a story about the fact that the belief in NFL circles is that it was the New England Patriots who made a phone call to Dave Gettleman and the Giants trying to get up to number two. Um, and, and this is an offer that you and I talked about leading up to the draft that we would not feel comfortable with the Giants moving, um, I believe they had, what picks they have, 20 and 22? 23 and 31. 23 and 31 were the two picks that the Patriots had. And according to Jeff Howe, citing the trade value chart, the Giants would probably have to fork over both their first round picks. No, the Patriots, you mean. The Patriots, rather. Both their first round picks, both their second round picks, a third round and a first round from next year to move up to number two. So that's six picks total. Would that have been worth it to you to move back? And this is the type of offer that the Giants might have been entertaining rather than taking that's, Saquon Barkley. Would you have taken that pick? That I, would, I would have taken that. If that's the trade we're talking about, three first round picks, two second round picks. Yes, I would have taken that trade. And yes, the Giants might have got killed in the short term from the media or from their fans or whatever. They wouldn't have had the pomp and circumstance of a of a Saquon Barkley press conference. His jersey wouldn't be the number one seller on NFL.com. Uh, but I think it would have made your football team better. Look at what the Patriots did. They got Isaiah Wynn, the uh, uh, offensive lineman, and um, and Sony Michelle, the running back, both from Georgia. So you're gonna so you're gonna give me Sony Michelle, Isaiah Wynn. I'm going to get Will Hernandez. So now I have two of the top three offensive linemen in the draft because I have Will Hernandez with my pick. Then yep. I'm going to then I'm going to get all the guys that the Giants already all the guys they drafted anyway. Will Hernandez, Lorenzo Carter, B.J. Hill, McIntosh. And you're going to give me uh, another offensive lineman in the first round win. Sony Michelle, a running back, two more second round picks and a first round pick. And let's call it what it is. The Patriots pick is probably going to be 30 next year. Um, but you're going to give me another first round pick next year. Yeah, I probably would have done that. So I'd have entertained it. But again, I, I think that this is the intersection of two philosophies. The first philosophy is, are you trying to build your team out for three to five years down the line? And that's where you get that extra first round pick next year. and That helps you to that end. Um, or are you trying to win now? And, and the cautionary tale, I think, is the Cleveland Browns and the Carson Wentz trade. They, they essentially got one starting caliber player in all of the picks across three drafts that they got well, bad. for Carson Wentz. Well, they're bad at drafting. They're terrible. And, and I don't disagree. They're terrible at drafting. But I think that you can, as Dave Gettleman said, get too cute. Would I have taken it? Probably not. Just based on everything else that they've done this offseason, making the trade for Alec Ogletree, bringing in Nate Solder. This is a team and this is an organization trying to make a splash and win now and make a push with Eli Manning. And I think that you get the, the transcendent talent at running back. I think that helps you in that end for the next two years. And, and there's just so much uncertainty around the draft in the future where I don't know that moving back 18 picks, 20 picks and losing out on that blue chip type of prospect yeah. in what they're trying to do. I don't know yeah. that that's beneficial. I'm not saying I would be playing for the future because I, I I still think you can make that trade and win now. And this might be the benefit of hindsight, knowing who went in those spots. But if you're telling me that I get uh, 
And you Sonia know, Michelle was the number two running back on my. Right. I get. So I mean, not, you're telling, it's not like um, it's not like I'm going into next season with no running back. I mean, right. if, if I told you right now, Matt, you have one to one is no chance it happens. Ten is it definitely happens. What are the chances Sony Michelle has a better rookie season than Saquon Barkley? Maybe a four. So I mean, exactly. So I yeah, exactly. So like, it's it's possible, right? It's it's right. It's, it's it's somewhere between unlikely and possible. And the fact so, that he's and the fact that he's in New England is what bumped it from a one to a yeah, four. By so, the way, Play, playing with Brady. So un- and by the way, let's not let's not forget Ryan. This also violates a cardinal rule that. When Bill Belichick picks up the phone and offers any trade, especially one with this type of a package, yeah. you hang up immediately. Yes, that's, right? <laughs> yes, that's true. I, yeah, I would never, I would never make a trade with Bill Belichick. If Bill Belichick offered me a gourmet dinner for the sandwich I just dropped on the floor in my kitchen, I would say no. Sorry, can't do it. So, but but I think that it is is interesting, and and obviously. The long form view of how we look back on this draft is going to be tied to the careers of Saquon Barkley and Sam Darnold because this is New York, right? And the Jets just landed a potential franchise quarterback or at least a quarterback that. How, have that how funny would that be? How fun, in all seriousness, man, how funny would that be? And I know you grew up in Pennsylvania and South Jersey, so you might not grasp quite the in, the inferiority complex that grips Jets fans around here. But how funny would it be if finally after 50 years or whatever, the way the Jets got their Joe Namath, uh, their Joe Namath successor, their second best quarterback in franchise history is because the Giants decided to hand them to him. I mean, that would be that'll be a, that'll be that's a 30 for 30 waiting to happen. And and just to come full circle on this conversation, Ryan, I think that that would definitely be a 30-30 worth watching. But to come full circle, the one move that I think that the Giants should have done if they had their sights set on Saquon Barkley, which they clearly did, if I'm Dave Gettleman, I would have put up the smoke screen to end all smoke screens that I'm taking Sam Darnold, that he's my guy, that I love him, that he's a five tool player. Uh, yeah. he, he's built for New York. And then I would have picked up the phone and I would have called Mike McC- McCagnon either leading yeah. up to the draft on draft night. Yeah. And I would have said, listen, if you want Sam Darnold, I want pick number three and I want a second round pick this year and a second round pick next year. And and I think that that's where you could have really helped your franchise in the short term and near term. Uh, I I forget. I believe the jets didn't have a second round pick though, because of the deal uh, with the Colts, but I would have tried to finagle an extra pick or two out of the jets to get something in addition to getting Barkley. It wouldn't have been hard because the number two and three teams in last year's draft, the Niners and the Bears, made a trade. So the market value is very clear on what it takes to move up from number three to number two. So uh, you basically could have just copied their trade last year. And if the Jets didn't have a second round pick this year, then, you know, whatever. Then you have to give me two thirds or a or two or a second next year and a second the year after whatever. No, I, I agree. And I think that that if you want to talk about you talked about Denver being the ideal scenario, I think this would have been the ideal trade for Gettleman to make. And the one that in hindsight, they probably should have made it make an effort to, to pull off. But I, I just think that if you don't view these quarterbacks as franchise face of your franchise quarterbacks, elite signal callers for a decade, then you have to come away with the best player in this draft. And I give Gettleman high marks for for doing that if these quarterbacks don't pan out. Yeah. So let's get to let's uh, let the people know each other a little bit here. Uh, let's let them get to know us a little bit. So Gettleman said he was he wasn't offered more than uh, a bag of donuts, a hot pretzel and a hot dog of your of those three things, Matt, which is your go to bag of donuts, <sighs> hot pretzel or hot dog. I, I, I'm a Philly guy through and through. So I have to go with the soft pretzel. Give me the hot, soft pretzel. Okay. That's the only thing out of that bunch that I probably would have entertained. Okay, I I would crush a bag of donuts, hot, hot <laughs> apple cider donuts. Oh, God, give me give me the bag of donuts any day. I, I, just to get things clear here, I am not a hot dog guy, so I don't know about you, but I, I think like the hot my, dog. I, I like Nathan's. So yeah, Nathan's is good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm just not a. I'm a. You'll find out on the road with me. I'm a very picky eater. There are probably five or six items that I eat on a regular basis, and a hot dog is nowhere near the list. Okay. Yeah. I like the chocolate glaze from Dunkin' Donuts too. That's a good donut. 
Nice, nice. All right. So, so now that we've covered the food bases, we've covered what we should or shouldn't have done if we were Dave Gettleman in the catbird seat as it comes to trades. We've talked about the Barkley pick. We've graded the pick, uh, pick by pick. Big picture draft grade. I give Gettleman an A for this draft. What would you give him? I'd probably give him a B plus, but. We, I, if you give me a minute, I'll f- see if I can find the email. I think it's really funny. Uh, someone sent us an email the other day that while all everybody is tripping over themselves to give Gettleman an A uh, in this draft, and you know, look, he, he did a good job. Here's the, here we go. Here, here are what people gave Jerry Reese the last couple years, 2017. NFL.com gave him a B plus. SI.com gave him a B minus. 2016, B plus and A. 2015, A minus and B minus. 2014, B and B. 2013, B and B. So those are all from NFL.com and SI.com. And they're all nowhere did he do anywhere worse than a B minus or a B, um, a couple of A's in there. Uh, and in the benefit of hindsight, all Jerry Reese's drafts were pretty much terrible so and yet he was fired right yeah yeah he was fired and rightfully i mean those drafts in hindsight the giants only have like a couple of those players left on their team and other than the first round picks haven't really worked out so uh and one of them is about to not yeah one of them is not about to not be here and that's eric flowers right and and eric flowers has yet to show up to any element of the off-season program didn't show up to the voluntary workouts was absent during the voluntary three-day mini camp hasn't been to quest diagnostic training center this off-season and on tuesday he hired super agent Drew Rosenhaus. Now, Ryan, you've written extensively about the fifth year option and the fact that the Giants have a decision to make on that before the regular season even begins. I spoke to Drew Rosenhaus. He told me that um, he has great connections and a great relationship with the Giants organization. He plans on speaking to them soon about Eric Flowers. Um, Two things here. One, is this the exit strategy to get out of East Rutherford? Or two, could this just be Eric Flowers covering his bases and having a legitimate agent for the moment in time that seems to be inevitable now where he's a free agent on the street looking for his next job? Where do you fall on this? Uh, Listen, it certainly could be the latter. It certainly could be that he realizes him and his dad are in over their heads. I mean, I think Lamar Jackson and his mom would be wise to follow suit and hire an agent. There's a region reason agents exist. Uh, it's kind of like how everybody now thinks they can start up a uh, blog and be a sports writer. Uh, there's a reason that you go to school for this kind of thing. And there's a reason you have training in this kind of thing. Uh, so I think that um, they should, uh, they could be covering their, their butts, but I think more likely it is an exit strategy. It's hire Drew Rosenhaus to say, hey, put out some feelers, see who's interested in me, uh, work with the Giants to get me the heck out of here. They don't want me. I don't want to be here. Uh, and it's better if I'm not handling it myself. It certainly seems like Drew Rosenhaus was brought in here to to play arbiter and get this thing over with. Yeah, I think it, it you know could be a move to facilitate a trade and trying to field offers. And there were multiple reports during the NFL draft, and no real surprise or secret here that the Giants were trying to move on from Flowers during the draft last week, and they obviously didn't get any takers. Uh, right? I don't know at this point that you're going to be able to wrangle anything more than a conditional sixth or seventh round pick for Flowers, but it's something, right? It's something that you can get in return for him. Um, I, I don't know that there are many teams that are storming the gates to to give that kind of an offer, knowing full well that once mandatory minicamp arrives and once Eric Flowers doesn't show up for that, or once the Giants can save face with the NFLPA and not cut him for not being around during the voluntary portion of workouts, they're going to cut him, right? So as much as Drew Rosenhaus and Flowers might be trying to move on. I just don't see the Giants getting anything in return, and I don't see them bringing him back um, even if he does report. I think that they're done with this guy. I will say this. If he doesn't show up for the mandatory part of the offseason, then, yeah, they probably will cut him. But I don't think they'll cut him if he shows up for that or um, if he – You know, or before that, before that, you know, hard kind of deadline. I don't think they are just going to cast him aside because it doesn't make sense financially. Eric Flowers is still, for all his, 
you know, underachieving is still, in my opinion, the second best offensive tackle on this team. And your second best offensive tackle probably. <laughs> I, I, I was like ready to like jump down your throat thinking you were going to say second best offensive tackle in the league. But no, yeah. I, I agree. Other than Nate Solder, he's probably their best. So I don't think you just toss him aside. You're not saving any money. I don't think you just toss him aside uh, for for not. I mean, the tr- trading him is one thing. You save two and a half million dollars in cap space. You, you save. You get something back at least. But just to cut a guy when you could put him, you stick him in there, and if he stinks at right tackle, then you put him on your bench, and he's there in case somebody gets hurt. He's better than anybody off the street that you're going to get. The only thing is if you think he's going to sour the locker room, and the Giants have brought in enough new faces, enough guys they think are leaders, that if Eric Flowers goes sour, uh, you would think these guys would whip him into shape. Yep. No, I, I think that there's something to be said for that. I just think that this regime, in terms of the front office with Dave Gettleman, this coaching staff with Pat Shermer and Shula, I think that they've they've seen on tape the struggles that Flowers has had. They know that they're trying to make a position change and move him to right tackle. And it, it doesn't sound like they're going to be all that patient with him, saying things in the media that the best five offensive linemen are going to play. How Hunter telling me during the voluntary um, workouts or prior to them that, you know, hey, we'll, we'll see how it works out, but sometimes you can't re-record over the old tape and the old habits. I, I don't know that they're just gift wrapping this guy a starting job at right tackle. And if that's I the don't case, think they're gift wrapping it. I think he's better than everybody else. That's I he mean, might I, be. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think it's gift wrap, but I think if he shows up and even if he's as bad as he's been, he's still better than everybody else. Yeah. yeah and I, you got to stop looking at Eric Flowers as a first round pick. Stop treating it. Stop expecting him to be. You know who's a good for Brandon Sheriff or uh, or uh, or the guy on the Eagles, Lane uh, Johnson. Lane Johnson. Stop expecting that. He's not that. Stop. Just look at him as f- number seventy four, fourth year pro or whatever, and he's better than the other guys they have on the team, or better than most of the guys you're going to find on the street. Stop right. expecting him to be a first year tackle and look at him in a video game terms. He's a uh, seventy two right tackle. Yeah, Ryan. I get all that. We also just. Just haven't seen him play right tackle consistently for the Giants. And if you're going to, it goes back to the, to a much lesser extent, obviously, but it goes back to the Kyle Lalletta Davis Webb situation. Are you going to dedicate time and resources to developing Eric Flowers as a right tackle, or are you going to focus on the guys that have been in camp and try to get some upside out of them? I I don't know the answer to that question, and I don't know that the Giants necessarily want to invest that fifth-year option in him. Oh, that's not happening. That the fifth year option, I think it's like twelve million dollars or something. That they the fifth year, it's a one year deal for Eric Flowers. It's play out this year. If they invest the twelve, I mean, I will I will be flabbergasted. It's can you get one more year out of this guy? Arm twisted behind your back, gun to your head, all those terrible metaphors of things that could happen to you on an unfortunate basis. Is (laughs) Eric Flowers on this team in training camp this year? No trade. I, I agree. No, under any circumstance, that's trade or release. I just I think we've reached the point of no return. And Dave Gettleman's frustration during the draft of, hey, he's in Miami. We're here. Call him. That told me everything I needed to know about where these things stand, because they've been far more delicate about the absence of Snacks Harrison from the offseason program than they have been with Eric Flowers. And this goes after signing Nate Solder, this goes after saying they're going to move him to right tackle, not necessarily giving him a clean slate in that change. I just don't think that he's here. So uh, now that that's out of the way, we'll see how it plays out. Um, next thing up for the Giants, A, Ryan, what do they have to do from here remaining this offseason? And B, uh, let's preview the upcoming mini camp a little bit for rookies when they show up for the first time next week. All right. So I'll get so aside from figure out the flowers debacle to me, the next thing they have to do is figure out the Beckham uh, situation. I I don't think they can get to July or August, uh, put Beckham in front of a microphone and have us all ask him about his contract. It really needs to be settled before then. I don't I mean, who knows? We still don't know if you know, look, Beckham showed them a lot of good faith. They his credit. He was here a lot of this voluntary offseason program. Uh, he's dying to get back on the field. I mean, you do, there's this perception of Odell Beckham, I think, that he's like spoiled or a diva or whatever. That's Odell not the Beckham case at all. Was dying to get yep. on that field. 
football practice in shorts, that means nothing. When he could do more damage to his ankle than help his ankle, he was dying to run routes, to jump passes. He did one time, he sprinted horizontally across the field and ran full speed into like a, one of those like wrestling mat pads. Like, I mean, this guy, he was like a little kid out there. He is dying to get back on the football field. I think that the number one thing they have to do between now and training camp is settle this debacle so that Eric, so that Odell Beckham doesn't have to be the one to decide if he's going to hold out or not. Yeah, and, and I think that that is priority number one. And it's worth noting, I, I spoke to Cody Latimer um, during this voluntary minicamp, and he said any you know preconceived notions that people have of Odell Beckham Jr. as a teammate, uh, they're wrong. You, you can talk about what he does off the field and, and his personality and all those things, but they love playing with this guy. They, they love having him in the locker room. People yeah. laugh more when he's around. He, yeah. he lightens the mood. Um, he's a good teammate and mentor to the other receivers on this team. So I think that Odell Beckham Jr. is a teammate. I don't think he gets enough credit there. A lot of reasons to criticize him, but I don't think that's one of them. I, I think, Ryan, they still need to go out. They need to find some depth at cornerback and free agency. I think they obviously have to try and re-up Odell Beckham Jr. And if you're not going to commit to Eric Flowers or if Flowers doesn't show up or you wind up trading him, I think you need to find an answer at left tackle, whether that's in-house or bringing a street free agent in for a tryout, because I, I think that if you have Solder and Hernandez playing alongside each other at left tackle, you got to figure out what you're doing on the right hand side. Well, they brought in Omema, so uh, they obviously think he'll be the star- one of the two starting guards. So it's interesting. If Hernandez and Omema are the starting guards, the guy who's displaced is veteran John Jerry. You know who John Jerry's agent is? Uh, who that would be one Rosenhaus comma Drew, correct? Yes. Yes. Who is now also Eric Flowers agent. So uh, be interesting to see how those quote unquote good relationships he has with the Giants play out. Should be interesting. And of course, rookie minicamp this week, Giants brought in a lot of undrafted free agents. This will be our first look at this draft class. Uh, the veterans won't be there, but I'm kind of excited to see when you have Loletta and Barkley and Hernandez on the field together. Maybe that's a glimpse of the offense three years down the line. But but nevertheless, I kind of want to see, again, no pads, shorts and shells, just like the regular camp. I, I kind of want to see, A, where Will Hernandez lines up, and I want to see Barkley and what he's able to do running behind. Them. Yeah, I, I I mean, obviously that stuff interests me. The, I really get into the non uh, – I get into the non, the other guys. The, the undrafted, bottom of the roster guys? Yeah, undrafted free agents and the rookie guys, rookie tryout guys. Yeah, a couple undrafted free agents are going to make this team. It happens every year. Two, three, four, whatever are going to make this team. A rookie tryout guy, maybe he gets extended to training camp. That would be a super Cinderella story if somebody from a rookie tryout actually makes the roster. That almost never happens. Uh, but the UFA signings, the priority guys, a guy like Nick Gates from Nebraska, uh, a guy like uh, the center, Grant Haley. center for Grant Haley, the cornerback from Penn State, yep. the center Evan Brown, I think, from SMU. SMU, uh, yep. Yeah, those guys, I'm very interested to see those guys because those are guys, they come in with a super chip on their shoulder. Those are the guys that maybe it's because of my days covering Rutgers and how many uh, Rutgers players made the NFL as UFAs. Those are the guys that I think uh, I'll be really interested in to see who flashes in those days because you assume all those guys are on a level playing field, but they're not. Some of those guys pop out immediately. We spent a lot of this offseason talking on Andrew Norwell, the uh, former Ohio State guard who joined the Panthers as a UFA and is now an all pro highest paid guard in the NFL uh, who the Giants wanted this year. He was a Gettleman find as a UFA in Carolina. Uh, So these UFAs are not all on the same level of playing field. You'll know within two days who the top ones are. Yeah, but I think Evan Brown has a legitimate chance to make this team. And and I'm going to throw down the gauntlet right now, Ryan. I think he has a chance to push for the starting center job. I, I don't think that you have uh, a, a great incumbent situation there. He's six foot three, three hundred seven. Played at SMU, rather big time program, rather big time offense. And I think I, we're going to see. Go ahead. I like Brett Jones as a starter. I think he can handle that job, uh, but he's cert- he's only got a one year deal right now, so he's certainly not a long term answer. And the backup center situation was bad in minicamp. There were a lot of botch snaps and yep. stuff. I like Brett Jones, but Evan Brown, I, I could see as the number two center on the team. And, for sure. and I think we're going to see a legitimate roster battle play out during this rookie minicamp and in the minicamps between Aaron Davis, the cornerback out of Georgia, and Grant Haley, the cornerback out of Penn State. Davis, 
a guy who played a little bit more on the outside during his college career. Yeah. He fits the profile of a long, lean, physical cornerback. He's six foot, 225 pounds. And Grant Haley's a guy that can step in and take reps in the slot, maybe push for a backup nickel uh-huh. cornerback job. But I don't think you keep both. And I think it's going to be fascinating to watch the battle play out between those two. I'm going to set an over under right now. Uh, we'll set it at 16. In those two days of rookie minicamp, does Grant Haley get more or less than 16 questions on Saquon Barkley? <laughs> well, he's going to have to split them with Tyrell Chavis. So yeah. you're going to have two Nittany Lions that are a- answering yeah. questions about Saquon Barkley. So I'm going to I'm going to set the under on Haley, oh, but okay. the over on, on the, the total asked about him. OK, that's fair. Ryan, any parting shots before we get out of here? The next time we'll uh, speak to the listeners here is after that rookie minicamp. But uh, any parting thoughts on the draft? No, the- uh, did we say when it is? So that minicamp is Mother's Day weekend, uh, 11th, 12th, I think, yes. uh, 12th, 13th, something like that. So that'll be the, a date to circle on your calendar for Giants coverage for sure. But we'll have plenty before, between now and then on both the draft picks and some leftovers from that minicamp. I talked to Teddy Williams and uh, B. J. Goodson for some stuff. I know you have some leftovers there too. Yep. Uh, so we'll keep we'll keep you covered right up until then on the draft picks and on the current roster, and obviously circle that mini camp on your calendar. Yep, it should be a lot of fun. And guys, football's back. The NFL draft is in the rear view. Rookie mini camp comes up in two weeks. After that, it's OTAs, and eventually in June, it's the mandatory mini camp, and then the break before training camp heats up in July and August. But this is going to be a lot of fun, Ryan. It was a fun weekend. Uh, once again, if you could follow us on Twitter, we'd really appreciate it. He's at R Y Dunleavy. I'm at Matt Lombardo NFL. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker. Freaker, Stitcher, Google Play, and throw us a like on YouTube as well. We'd really appreciate it. And if you like what you heard, please give us a five-star review and a rating in iTunes and the Apple Podcast Store. This has been the Talk is Cheap Podcast. He's Ryan Dunleavy. I'm Matt Lombardo. We'll talk to you next time here on NJ.com.